One of the distributions that I've been meaning to take a look at for a little while is Fedora Silverblue. And I've always been putting it kind of off just because I'm not a big GNOME fan. Like, I think if you've followed the channel for any amount of time, you'll know that I'm just not a GNOME fan. And I kept pushing Silverblue off for that reason. I just, like, I didn't want to use GNOME. The idea behind Silverblue was always interesting, but again, it's GNOME, so I didn't really want to use it. But there is an alternative project also done by Fedora that's called Kino White. And Kino White is the same idea as Silverblue, but instead of GNOME, it uses KDE. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. Now, this is a, like a first look video, very early stages. I've been using it now for about three days off and on. And my idea of what Silverblue and Kino White actually you know, what those things are is a, it, it is very much in its early stages. I'm just now kind of getting my eye, my head around it. So if I make a mistake in something that I say, just know that it's done out of ignorance, not malice. So I do plan on using Kino White now for the next month or so, and I'll do a long-term review video after I'm done. So what I should do first is talk about what the idea behind Silver Blue and Kino White actually is. And that idea is something that is kind of unique in the Linux space. You don't find distributions that are like this very often. I think there are a couple others, but really Kino White and Silverblue are the ones that are the most popular and the ones that are most developed. So the idea behind them is that they are immutable. And if you don't know what that word means, don't worry about it. I didn't either. From what I can tell, immutable means that there is a portion of the Linux file system, basically the stuff that makes up Linux itself, that is completely untouchable by the user or user space. And what this allows Kino White and Silverblue to do is to be very, very stable and also to have it so that each version of Kino White or Silverblue are exactly the same as all the rest. As long as the versions are the same, that portion of the operating system never changes. And that allows for developers to be able to test programs and containers and all this stuff easily, knowing that the system that they're on is going to be the same no matter what install of that system it happens to be. It also has other benefits as well, because if that stuff that makes up the Linux system is in a container, and not accessible by anything, it means that that stuff is secure. And that makes the entire system more secure. Now, like I said, I don't know if I'm explaining that well or if I'm even explaining it correctly. I'm still getting my head around what immutable means and why it's good. From what I can tell, mostly at this point, it's mainly focused towards developers. So if you're not a developer, the benefits of an immutable system, they're kind of superfluous. They're not necessarily something that is going to give you a lot of benefits. It doesn't mean that you can't use it. It doesn't mean that it's not good. It's just that a lot of the things that are built into something like Kino White are more suited towards people who are going to be developing software of certain kinds. With that being said, I thought I would try it out. So wh what I'm going to do today is just kind of take you through a few of my initial thoughts about Kino White itself. So let me actually show you my Kino White system. And this is what this it looks like now. Now, like I said, this is just the standard KD Plasma desktop. I've done some ricing, obviously, because of course I did. And there's not a lot here that is going to initially set this apart from other distributions. Like if you just popped in front of a computer, it had Kino White on it, you wouldn't know that this was different than just regular Fedora. Where things go different is how you install software. So the suggested way of installing software is through Flatpak. It's the way you're supposed to install the vast majority of your software. And you can use the FlatHub repository so you can get a wide selection of software through Flatpak. And it's really easy. You can install it through the terminal if you wanted to install it from the terminal. You could do something like Flatpak, install Audacity if you wanted to, right? And I already have Audacity installed, but it would install Audacity. You can also use Discover if you wanted to use Discover. I don't know anyone who really likes Discover all that much, but I'm sure there are people out there like that. It's never been the best software store in the world, but it's not bad, and it's definitely gotten better over the last years. It's still pretty slow, but it's not as slow as the Snap Store. Let's put that out there. Anyways, you can install Flatpaks from there. And if you've enabled the FlatHub repository, FlatHub will also integrate here as well. That's the way you're supposed to install the vast majority of your software. 
And because Flatpak itself is containerized, it doesn't interact with that lower level system at all anyways. And it means that you're adding kind of a additional lever level of security on top of everything else. Now, what happens if you come across a program that isn't available through Pat, Flatpak or Flathub or any of the other Flatpak repositories? Well, there is a way to actually install things to your base system. And that is through a program called RPM Austri. Like so. And you just do install, let's just say Vim. Like Vim does not have a flat pack, so you'd have to install it like this. Now I've already done this, but this is how you'd install it. And one thing you'll notice is that you don't have to use sudo. Now, this is a part of the whole system that just kind of confuses me. Because I don't understand where this is being installed to. If it's being installed into that lower level system that is supposed to be completely untouchable by the user, why don't you have to use a root password? I don't understand that. Now, again, I'm just kind of getting my head around this, and it's possible that everything is being installed into like another portion of the system where it still doesn't have access to any of that protected stuff, and that means that you don't actually have to install it with a root password or a pseudo password. So I don't understand why that is. That's something that I'm going to have to discover and kind of learn over the next month or so. Because if you, if I were to install this, if I didn't already have it installed, it would go through and install it all the way to the end, never asking for a password. Now, the one thing that you should know, whether you use this or not, is that if you install through this system, you do have to restart your computer afterwards. Because this is making actual changes to your system by installing a binary of Vim. And... You, if you were to install this and not restart, you wouldn't have access to Vim until you did restart it. Now, I know that sounds a little bit like Windows, but the benefits are is that each time you install something, at least as far as I can tell, it makes a, I don't think it's called a snapshot, but it's something like that, where if you've installed something, you can actually use a previous version of your system, and you can choose that version of your system inside Grub. So if you wanted to choose something before you installed Vim, you could do so. And like I said, I don't think that this is meant as a backup system. I'm pretty sure that instead it's meant to be for developers who are testing different versions of software or something like that. Because it's not, it doesn't say anything about Butterfest, even though I'm sure that Fedora uses Butterfest. And maybe that's what it's kind of basing it on. But it calls it something different. I haven't really truly got into it yet, but you kind of get the idea that that kind of thing kind of exists. So you do have to restart your computer after installing software this way. And that's why they suggest you to get as much of your software as possible through Flatpak. Because if you use a Flatpak, you don't have to restart your computer. Now, that is the primary thing that makes Kino White and Silver Blue different, is the way you install software are these two different ways, and one of them is kind of more of a struggle than the other. And it's really recommended that you always use Flatpak wherever possible. Now again, like I said, I'm just getting my head around this, so I'm probably explaining some of this stuff wrong, right? I'm still trying to learn. I've, I've read through their documentation here. I've read all the way through this part here of trying to do up upgrades, rollbacks, and stuff like that. So I have some idea of what I'm talking about, but I'm still getting to some of this other stuff. Now, one of the things that I'm, I don't know if I'll get into a lot is the idea of a toolbox. And this allows, from what I understand, very, very noob level of understanding here. But a toolbox allows you to create like a, your own like sandbox and allows you to create a system inside there that will allow you to develop things without ever touching any part of your system. Usually things like Podman and stuff like that. But as you can tell... I don't know much about containers, so getting into this is going to take a little bit of mental strain on my part in order to actually understand this, but that's for later. I haven't gotten into it at all yet. All right, so outside of the odd way of installing software, what is the system like to use? Well, this version of KDE is one of the most buggy versions of KDE that I've ever used in my entire life, and I've used KDE a lot over the last five years. Like, I used to be the biggest KD fanboy ever. It was my desktop environment of choice before I discovered window managers. And this version of KDE Plasma is very, very buggy. So I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to recreate this. Probably not. But if I were to change a setting, so let's just go to uh, win, work, window management here. No, nope, that's not the right one. Workspace behavior, maybe? Yeah, there we go. Uh, if I wanted to change the screen edge, 
So I hit no action and hit apply. Uh, and that actually worked just fine. What I've experienced is that the settings app crashes all the time. And of course it's not gonna do it on camera. It's gonna work perfectly fine. I don't know why the settings app closes all or crashes all the time, but it does. And it always does it right after you've hit apply. I don't know what's going on there. I'm assuming that it's a KDE problem, not a, a Kinoi problem. But again, I haven't experienced it in other places. So that's been crashing all the time. I've also had problems where when my monitors go to sleep and I come back, one of the monitors is completely black. Now, it, you can move windows around to that other monitor and they show up just fine. You can use it just fine, but it basically, it just removes your wallpaper. And the thing is, is that's not a big deal. I would just right click and do configure desktop and change the wallpaper back to what it was, but you can't actually right click on it. It is completely broken when it comes to the desktop being interactable. I looked this up and this has been going on in KDE since 2015. There was a bug report in 2015 where this somebody experienced this and apparently hasn't been fixed. So that's definitely a KDE problem. The weird thing is, is I haven't experienced that specific problem on any other version of KDE that I've used. Uh, I have other problems with multi-monitors on my Arco install, where things like when I turn the monitors on, the panel moves from one screen to the other and back and forth. That's really weird, but that's an Xorg problem, I'm pretty sure, because Xorg doesn't like keeping the names of the monitors static, which is a little weird, but that's kind of beside the point. The only other thing that I should say is that this opium os tree command here is really slow like really really slow now d this is i don't know if it's based on dnf but it definitely takes after dnf dnf is not the fastest package manager in the world on any day of the week you can make it faster there are some tweaks to make dnf faster but for the most part there are many other package managers that are just way faster than dnf rpm tree is slower way slower than dnf is i have noticed that some programs install faster than others I'm assuming that has to do with package size, but just know going in, if you, when you do use this, be prepared for it to take a little while. Now, I wonder if I can actually show you how slow this is. So RPM Austree up, I think it's update or is upgrade. I can't remember. Let's go back here and find out. It is upgrade. Okay, so upgrade like so and move this here where you can actually see. We'll see if this actually takes as long as I think it did. It's actually probably going to go faster than uh, possible because I just did this last night. Yeah, it's it's faster than it was. But if you've waited a long time between updates, that takes quite a while. Like I'm talking like 15 minutes. It was last. It took a long time last night. And while that's not a big deal, because you're not supposed to use the at least the, the RPM Austri install thing very often at all. You're supposed to use Flatpak. I can see where when you do actually have to install an update, that could take quite a while. And that's just something that you should keep in mind. Again, not that big a deal because you're not going to be updating and upgrading very often anyways, but it's something to keep in mind. So those are my initial thoughts on Keto White. Just again, it's very early days. I've been using it for three or four days off and on, and it's not a horrible experience. The KDE stuff kind of by the wayside, that's just because KDE can be kind of buggy. I'm not blaming Kinoite for that. The actual idea behind an immutable Linux distribution, at least so far, is interesting. One of the things I'm going to have to strive to do over the next month is find a reason why people should use it, or more like normal people should use it. Because from what I can tell, at least so far, is that this is mostly am aimed at developers. But the reason why I was so interested in it is because I've heard a lot of people talk about Silver Blue and Kinoite, and they talk about how this is going to be basically the future of Linux, how in the future every Linux distribution is going to be immutable. And maybe that's true, because like the Steam Deck has an immutable operating system on it. The user has no access to that lower level system. And if the Steam Deck does that, you can see how other Linux distributions and things like that are going to try to kind of emulate that. They're going to try to take that idea and like everything that Fedora does it kind of filters down into the rest of the Linux community and eventually they all adopt the things that Fedora does so if that holds true the immutability of the operating system is something that will also flow down into other distributions so that's why I wanted to take a look at it and see what the future holds if this is the future how is it going to be you know is it going to be great or is it going to suck you know are we all going to have to go back to using windows or is Linux going to continue to be, you know, pretty cool? Well, so far, it's okay. Uh, there's definitely some things that are 
different. There's definitely some things that I would change, but uh, so far, you know, it's not that it's still interesting to me. I haven't uh, nuked and paved yet. So that is it for this video. If you have thoughts on Kino White or Silver Blue, you can leave those in the comment section below. I Again, I, I just want to reiterate that this is very early days and I may or may not have done a very good job of explaining what this actually is. So if you have questions, leave them in the comment section below. I will try to answer them or maybe somebody else will have a better answer than I will. That's always possible. Usually likely. Anyways, if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do so. If you want to follow me on Mastodon or any other social media network, uh, you can find those links in the video description. Uh, if you'd like to support me on Patreon, you can do so at uh, patreon.com slash linuxcast. I'd like to thank my current patrons, Robert, Sid, Devon, Patrick, Fred, Kramer, Tridevil, Meglin, Jackson, Iphone Tools, Steve A, Separate Linux, Garrick, Samuel, KB, TGB, Keith, Andy, Uncle Bonehead, Gary, Antoine, Mitchell, J-Dog, Carbon Data, Jeremy, Sean, Odin, Martin, e, Ross, Eduardo, Archer, Elliot, Mislov, Merrick, Camp, Joshua Lee, Peter A, Crucible, Dark Minutes, Extremes, VM. Thanks everybody for watching. I'll see you next time.